Welcome back to Plague Size Studios, everyone. Ryan here, and today's Gear Curiosity is perhaps one of the most controversial releases from an otherwise critically acclaimed California ant builder, the Mesa Boogie Cab Clone. <laughs> Today's video was made possible by a very gracious viewer named Alan. Thank you so much for lending me your cab clone for this review. If you have any piece of gear that you think I might get along with or you'd like to see me make a video on, then do hit me up at the business email below. Maybe we can work something out. It's way cheaper for me to pay shipping here and return it to you than it is for me to buy something used and then try to flip it later if I'm not impressed with it, which uh, a lot of this stuff, that's the way it ends up going. So um, the Cab Clone, this is a very interesting product in the sense that I've never seen anyone cover it in the way that I want to. So I'm excited to finally be able to analyze this in a way that if I were interested in buying a product like this again, this is the kind of stuff I would want to see. And it's a product whose intentions I admire, but they stumble in basically every category that's important for a product like this. So for the, the remainder of this video, I'm gonna be comparing this a lot to the Two Notes Torpedo Captor. This is the load box attenuator speaker sim DI all-in-one that I actually use to record a lot of the amplifier demos you hear. Basically any use case that requires an otherwise silent amplifier or a direct signal this is probably what I'm using. And I think this product in particular or any of its competitors on the market today are really superior products compared to the Mesa Boogie Cab Clone. So for those of you that don't watch these videos in their entirety, I would say to you, do not buy this thing new in current year. It doesn't matter when you're watching this, just don't. Maybe there'll be a successor in a few years, who knows, but they're still selling these brand new for some ungodly reason. Um, and there's only a couple very specific use cases where I could say you could buy this used and significantly discounted um, and maybe it would be worth your while. But nine times out of 10, I'm going to recommend something different. And in this video, I'm going to show you why. So let's start with a quick physical tour. You'll notice there's a lot of similarities in input, output, and even the overall size of this, even though it is a little more square and flat. This is still something that if you remove the leg support here, you could slide in say a 2U rack shelf. Um, you can set it on top of your amplifier like so in its default state, which is pretty cool. That I do like about it. And you have a plethora of input output ranging from where you would plug in your amplifier uh, from your speaker outputs. I do like the kind of dummy proofed implementation that Two Notes has here marked in red. That way you can always know, but just, just read and it's not that hard. Um, you have a through option, which this has as well. You have a line out for a DI if you want to run basically the equivalent of a slave out. So you have the power amp sound as well, but no cabinet emulation. You have a headphones output, which this does not have. So it gives an, an advantage to here if you want to just practice with a tube amplifier completely silently. Then you have the balance out, which has the cabinet emulation which you turn on the front and you see there's a three-way selection switch between a closed back, open back, and vintage cabinet model. I use quotes there specifically <laughs> for a reason. Um, we have a ground lift switch, which again is present on the front here. And we have a phase inversion, 180 degrees out. And then you have the level, which actually gives you kind of specific settings with an instrument uh, negative 10 dB and even a line level plus 4 dB setting, which I'm not sure exactly how accurate that is, given this is an analog potentiometer after all, but it does kind of beat the otherwise 0 through 10 line level here. And um, this has basically all the same things this does with the advantage of having a negative 20 dB attenuated output, which is cool. This is really useful if you want to achieve those cranked amp tones without actually making the volume that accompanies that. So this is a pretty good setting. I'd prefer like an attenuator potentiometer there, but it's whatever. Um, and of course, this also has a couple cabinet models um, where you can bypass it all together on the balance output or use a guitar or bass model. So they kind of trade blows on paper. They're more or less, you know, equivalent in terms of their feature sets. 
but what actually matters is under the hood. So with that, let's discuss some of the important things that a load box like this needs to achieve in order to accurately substitute, or in this case, clone a cabinet in your signal chain, because speakers provide a very important tonal and even circuit role um, when used with a guitar amplifier. So the first thing, arguably the first two things that one of these needs to do is provide a dummy load and a reactive load, preferably. And what I mean by dummy load is you'll see in the back here, this is rated at eight ohms. You can buy these in four, 16 ohms as well, much like the captor. And that's because if you look on the back of any tube amplifier, you're gonna see speaker outputs that you can either switch the impedance or it will be rated at a fixed four, eight, 16 ohms. Unlike many of their solid state equivalents, two power amps expect some sort of load on their output transformer. So if you run one of these tube based heads without a load whatsoever, you're asking for trouble. You're gonna damage at least one, probably several components in the power amp section. So that's where this little dummy load of eight ohms comes in handy, because obviously most speakers run in either eight, four, 16 ohms, or around that area, depending on how they're wired up. So as long as you have some load on your power amp, it's gonna be happy. But there's something else important that happens with these kind of loads, and it works in kind of a feedback loop because you see resistance in the DC world is, is pretty easy. Resistance is resistance. Eight is eight ohms, four ohms is four ohms. When we get into the world of AC and impedance, things get a little more complicated. Impedance and resistance may share the same unit of ohms, but the way that impedance reacts and behaves is kind of a strange beast. You see, if I put a 60 hertz sinusoidal wave through the speaker cabinet, you might be able to measure a certain impedance, call it two ohms, just to be simple. However, if you double that frequency, you might measure something entirely different, say 16 ohms, maybe even 20 ohms, 10 times what you measured before. But then you might measure a different fall off if you double it again at 240 hertz. So generally, a speaker's impedance curve looks something like this. The specific values and resonant frequencies you see here are bound to change between different speakers and cabinet models and even different speakers within the same model. But the overall trend is remarkably similar between all these speakers where you get a big resonant frequency somewhere between 70 and 110-ish hertz is a good bet. Um, you kind of scoop out three to 400 hertz and then it rises once again afterwards. And this is because all these speakers are built pretty similarly. You know, they've got different chassis and different coils and magnets and that sort of thing, but they all behave in a similar way. Well, as some of you may already know, there's quite the tonal difference depending on what load you use, but let's have a listen to that firsthand. To isolate all other variables, we'll be using the same amplifier, Mesa Boogie Mark IV, set to the lead channel, straight through the amp, no other pedals, and then we're gonna change which speaker load is attached to the eight ohm output. The first will be a real cabinet, the Mesa Boogie oversized four x 12 loaded with V30s, the second will be the two notes torpedo captor reactive load, which instead of being a real speaker, obviously uses a combination of resistors and inductors, other AC components to achieve a similar reactive load that we see here. Then we'll have the Mesa Boogie cab clone, which advertises itself as only being a resistive load. And we'll have a listen to the impact on the sound there. Then to complete the signal chain, I wanna run the slave output into my audio interface, load up a cabinet impulse response so you're not hearing anything else. Literally the only difference will be which one this is plugged into. Quite the difference in sound, wouldn't you say? But before we move on, let's put some numbers to what you just heard by measuring the frequency response of these loads compared to the real speaker. Now my 
methodology here is a bit flawed as I'm actually measuring the frequency response of the entire power amp and not just the reactive loads because I don't have like a oscilloscope that I can, you know, control this kind of stuff. But the more important thing is you'll see the differences between each one. So the absolute curve you see may not be exactly how this reacts. It's how this power amp is reacting plus these pieces of equipment. But the important thing is you will be able to see the difference that the reactive load makes since all other variables are isolated. So let's start with the real speaker cabinet in blue. That curve looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? It's the same pattern as the speaker impedance curve that I showed earlier, and it's right around that perfect resonant frequency of 100 hertz for this cabinet. Of course, again, depending on what speaker you're using and even what enclosure you're using, that can affect the resonant frequency here, but it does the same sort of scoop out at around 300 hertz and then continues to climb, peaks out at about 17, 18K, which is beyond what you know, most guitar speakers are going to output significantly anyway, and you're going to cut a lot of that in, uh, in, you know, mixing and mastering. So the main takeaway here is the speaker impedance is almost a one for one match to the output frequency response of the power amp. So that's pretty cool that you can kind of translate it over in that way. The second curve in orange is the two notes captor, which as you can see, follows the real cabinet very closely, minus a couple caveats. So first of all, after about 3000 hertz, it doesn't have quite as much presence in the highs. Again, that's not core guitar tone territory, and it really just has a lack of air comparatively, but this is something that you can make up with your presence control, and again, you're cutting a lot of this in the mixing process anyway for direct applications. The more important thing is you don't have quite the resonant peak around 100 hertz. In this case, it's about a five decibel difference, which does make a significant change to the perceived depth when isolated, but again, when you put this in a mix, I end up cutting a lot of that anyway to, you know, make room for the bass guitar. So it actually kind of makes tube amps easier to work with, with this kind of reactive load. It just has a fallback in the sense that it's not as authentic as the real deal. Though, again, it's going to change depending on the cabinet and there very well may be some 4x12s that react more like this than mine. So um, definitely give this one a pass. It sounds great and that's why I ultimately use it. Then we have the Mesa Boogie Cab Clone in Silver, which aside from this extraneous low frequency roll off, which is present on all the data and therefore probably a result of my flawed testing methodology, you can still see this thing is basically flat, plus or minus half a decibel. And that is the result of a purely resistive load. Yes, the amplifier is happy. It has a dummy load and that's all you need if you're going to work on it or change tubes or whatever. But the thing is the audible difference is inexcusable. I mean, it goes from sounding like the real deal um, on recording to uh, flat, fizzly, no thump, no nothing, even if you use a quality impulse response. Now, this isn't entirely beyond saving. This is, after all, just an EQ curve. So if we applied an EQ plugin shape to look something like that, then we can make this sound much more like not only the captor, but the real cabinet. I feel it's about 90 to 95% of the way there where it's really hard to tell the difference and in a mix, it would be more than fine. So if that is all you have and you want to you know, use an amplifier that doesn't have a slave output, which is most of them, and you can run out of this line out, then it's not the end of the world. You can get a usable tone, but the live experience of playing through this I, it's just not the same. I don't know if there's some harmonic distortion happening somewhere else in the way that a reactive load pushes a power ramp, um, but it does work for recording. It's just disappointing that, again, for almost $150 more than these things are going for, that they couldn't have just done that to begin with. <laughs> Now, providing a dummy load is only half of the equation when it comes to the cab clone because this is ultimately advertised as your all-in-one speaker sim solution. So we still have to replicate the tone of the cabinet, which I use an impulse response in the last test 
just to level the playing field and isolate variables. But this has on board, you know, closed back, open back, vintage cabinets that you can access using the balance line output. But I don't want to stack too many variables here for the time being. Let's just have a listen to what these cab sims sound like by themselves. And you can do that by using the speaker through. Now on both of these load boxes, if you use the speaker through options, it actually defeats the internal load, meaning that it's gonna react the same way as if you plug straight into the cabinet, which is good for this test. Um, so let's have a listen to all of these with the through options mic'd up on the speaker cabinet. And then we're gonna have a listen to the through option using the balanced line output here. This would be a useful scenario when playing live since you'd still have a stage sound with an out loud cabinet, but this line output would prevent you from having to mic up that cabinet. You'd get the same sound every night and you could just take an XLR cable straight to front of house and you're done, choose your speaker model and uh, that's it. So once again, we'll have a listen to that and this will help us isolate the load versus the speaker cabinet models before we assess this product as a whole. around the bush for this segment. This is far from the worst cabinet simulation I've ever heard. It certainly beats out a lot of budget-friendly amplifiers from the past 20 or so years that had direct outputs, but this is priced as much, if not more, than a lot of those amps I'm talking about, so it doesn't quite as have much room for leniency as those. And ultimately, this is using the same form of onboard analog simulation, and that's always going to be inferior to digital impulse responses. In the terms of amplifier simulation, a lot of people would take a transistor amp over a digital amp model, and I, I get why, I get that. But when it comes to cabinet simulation, we're talking about such high resolution responses. I mean, have a look at this. This is your typical impulse response, well, response, where you can see for almost every frequency, there is an independent decibel rating, and that's why they're so high resolution and jagged looking. And when you compare that to the response of these cabinets, well, they don't even hold a candle to them. As this figure shows, not only is each cabinet model extremely smooth in terms of frequency response, which misses all of the detail that makes a speaker mic combination sound the way it does, which is accurately captured in an impulse response, but their only major difference here between the models is what, some presence at 3K? And I'm guessing that's really just the strength of the Q factor they're using on what appears to be a second order low pass filter. You got a little bit of roll off after like 200 Hertz, but I mean, this is, this is the bare minimum for cabinet simulation. It does sound better than obviously putting a raw line output um, through front of house where you're going to get a bunch of scratchy high end. So this does, you know, make it more mid focused and more believable, but it's nowhere near the quality of not only a decent graphic EQ pedal, but what especially you can achieve with impulse response loaders today. On top of all of that, no analog simulation like this or any other device for that matter, accurately captures the time response of a speaker cabinet, which is rather important. You know, if you hit a hard palm, you, you can feel that cabinet kind of resonate and slap back at you. And that's due to sort of reverbs in a way and you don't get that with analog signals. When the input stops, the output stops, and that doesn't happen with a real speaker cabinet or impulse responses for that matter. 
Now in fairness, the Torpedo Captor also slips up in the same way with its analog simulation and its frequency response isn't any more detailed or impressive in my opinion. I actually think the base side of things sounds better. Um, but at least they realize and advertise this thing. You know, they don't say this is your primary source of recording. Either one of these, if you use the speaker through, defeat the internal load, and you have cabinets on stage playing out loud, and you just use these balance lines to get a sound in front of house, it'll work. It won't be the best sound, but you know, you got a wall of speakers moving and it will sound more convincing that way. But with this, they realize that for recording, this is not gonna cut it for current year. <laughs> This is a backup. This is um, you know, a convenience option. That's why they give you the Two Notes Torpedo Suite software and you can load up cabinet IRs, you can use their own cabinet models. They got compression, power amp simulation, all this stuff where this is only being a reactive load at that point. And everything else in terms of tones comes from the software. And they do that for $150 less than this does. So you got a more accurate load, more accurate software emulation and kind of questioning why this exists at that point. But we've not seen the best yet. Up to this point, we've only evaluated the Cav Clone's resistive load and speaker simulation properties in isolation, but the real fun begins when you try to pair them because you have a completely flat reactive load, as in there's no reactivity, and then you add a simplistic EQ curve on top of it like that and you're in for a bad time. Now, if they had factored this in and at the very least added a separate mode that says, okay, if you're not using the through to live speaker cabinet, then we'll just add an EQ curve, say one of those resonant bumps that makes it look more like actually using a real reactive load, then this could have actually been useful in some ways. Um, but when you pair it together, when you use this as, as they advertise it, as a completely standalone product to clone your cab to replace the speaker in your signal chain, it is laughably bad. And this is where the reputation comes from. As I've shown throughout this video, if you slice and dice this device, holy alliteration Batman, uh, into a couple different units, then you can actually achieve usable sounds. Not the best out there, and it will require tweaking if you're looking for studio quality tones. But you know, if you made this just a DI thing um, that you can load an impulse response on, that'd be all right. If you just made this like the Friedman Mike No Mo, where you have just um, you know, a balance line out and you don't have to worry about a microphone, I could give it a little bit of leniency there as well. But with the way this is not only marketed, but the way this is priced is inexcusable. It was really inexcusable when it launched, but I could again give them a little bit more wiggle room seeing as how this was among the first to try this for a purely you know, consumer product where you didn't have to have an electrical engineering degree and <laughs> know how this stuff works. But nowadays, they should not be selling this straight up. Um, and if they do, it really needs a significant price cut. Because again, you got stuff like this for 250 The Sur Reactive Load is what, about $400? It's supposed to be even more accurate. You got the Fractal Audio X Load. Um, even Sur has one that loads impulse responses. There's other ones that do that as well. What were they thinking? Mesa Boogie has otherwise been a brand that's so obsessed with the minutia, every detail to make their amp sound unapologetically Mesa, and yet they try to sell you one of these things to pair with your boutique 1000 to 2000 even higher dollar amplifier and make it sound so subpar, so inadequate. Uh, I, I don't get it. I don't know where they went wrong with this. I can only assume they're so far outside of their league because they ultimately kind of threw in the white flag as they partnered with Two Notes to bring their real speaker cabinets into their own software. So that tells me that they're not confident enough in this product or any speaker simulation product. Uh, so why is this still being sold? This shouldn't be, or at the very least it needs to be discounted because again, I can name you so many products, whether it be the Two Notes line or the Sur line or the Fractal's own 
take on this uh, that do all of this better. And even if they don't do all of this in one box, they have something else that can do that. I mean, if you bought this and a more radar for 150 bucks, you're still hitting the same price. Not really that much more room, maybe a little more inconvenience. Um, and again, there's other products that do that all in one that just, they're more accurate. They sound better. And with that, I cannot recommend anyone buy this new for an all-in-one unit. I really can't recommend anyone buy this thing, period, for an all-in-one unit. But if you find one for like 100 bucks and you want to use this as just a purely reactive load or resistive load, rather, and use this to record amps direct and then add some EQ magic afterwards and make it sound better, it's doable. Um, and if you want to have this just as a microphone replacement, again, doable. Personally, though, I would rather just take my chances with the sound guy chucking an SM57 right up to the speaker cone and, and seeing what happens because this is so anti-Mesa. It has the trappings of a Mesa Boogie product. You know, it's well-constructed. It looks nice. You can see it's a, got a quality PCB and all that, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't sound good, and especially if it doesn't sound good as an all-in-one product as they advertise it as being. So... That kind of hurts to say coming from someone who does adore so many of their amplifiers, but without playing, you know, every product they've ever released, I have a very strong feeling this is among the worst things <laughs> they've ever put out. So, um, again, thank you, Alan, for letting me borrow and shit all over <laughs> your cab clone. And I'd give you the same advice I'd give anyone else. If you use this in very specific applications, it's workable. But to use this as an all-in-one, avoid like the plague. Um, yeah, it's it's bad. It is so inadequate that I would say that they shouldn't even try to reuse the cab clone name because there's been you know instances in the past where I've looked at stuff like a, a Line Six Pod, for instance, or some software, and said, you know what, this needs a sequel. I can see where they can do better here. With this, the reputation is probably too far gone. Just go with something else, uh, or in fact just let two notes handle it. That would be my recommendation. So that'll do it for today's Gear Curiosities. Any other questions, comments, please leave them down below. Hopefully we'll talk about something a bit more positive next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.